radio. The first medium of electronic communication. Radio. The American dream of the 1920s. Radio. The most widely used form of electronic communication in the world today. Radio. America's sound habit. This is Radio Past and Present, tracing the development of radio in America. The story of radio in America is a long one, now reaching back 50 years in history. The first part of Radio Past and Present will present some of the more informative, interesting, and historical highlights in the development of radio in America, spotlighting some of its early announcers, commercials, tragedies, programs, and growing pains, and how, from its humble, crude beginnings, radio became the undisputed power that it is today in 1970. The second part of Radio Past and Present will focus on the growth and trends of music in the 1950s and 1960s. Come with us, then, as we turn the clock back and take a bird's-eye view of the fabulous early days of radio. Hello again. This is Jack Benny welcoming you. On the broadcasting system and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Wrote out a verse to me in his own handwriting uh, from Longfellow. with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty... Hello, George King, Steven Stevens speaking. Hello, this is Mr. Carter of the Carter Construction Company. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. Hi. We are now in the year 1920. Many authorities on the history of radio feel this was the year that radio actually began. On November 20th of this year, six men sitting on the roof of a Westinghouse factory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, began what was probably the breakthrough in widespread radio broadcasting. These men, comprising station KDKA, broadcast presidential election returns that night. Tell us that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coley is running well ahead of Thompson Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has selected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a car, address station KDKA, Westinghouse. The estimated audience that night was somewhere around 1,000 people. Not bad for 1920 and 200 watts. But nonetheless, this was a beginning. Skipping over to 1921, another early station, WJZ in Jersey City, broadcast the world's first heavyweight championship fight between Jack Dempsey and George Carpentier. Major Andy White, then editor of the Wireless Age, was the announcer and the unforgettable voice of the fight as he kept over 100,000 people glued to their radio sets. Radio sets in those days were big, bulky, and full of static. Although the early styles varied, they were all about as big as a sewing machine cabinet. Housed in beautiful hardwood cabinets, the earliest sets used earphones rather than loudspeakers. One source labeled early radio as 1% music, 1% interference, and 98% static. Nonetheless, while radio was experiencing its growing pains, it gave Americans a new pastime as families gathered around their consoles to hear the new unique form of entertainment that radio provided. Radio was in.
By the end of 1921, there were over 500 radio stations operating in America, captivating more than 3 million listeners. In 1922, on the 26th day of August at 5.15 p.m., radio took one of its biggest leaps and went commercial. Station WEAF in New York broadcast a 10-minute advertisement for a group of buildings in Jackson Heights, New York. The spot sold for $100 and rapidly paved the way for commercial advertisements in radio. Barbasol, Barbasol, the brush with shaving cream supreme. Leaves your face so smooth and clean. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Twelve full ounces, that's a lot. Twice as much for a nickel, too. Pepsi Cola is the drink for you. Rinse white and rinse bright. L A V A L A V A. 1922 holds more significance in the development of radio than commercials. The National Association of Broadcasters was founded as an institution to outline guidelines and regulations for radio stations. This institution is still around and even today exerts much more influence on radio and television alike. Nineteen twenty six was another key year as twenty stations were linked together by telephone lines and collectively called the National Broadcasting Company, the first of the networks. Now, what one station played, all twenty could broadcast simultaneously. The following year, NBC's competitor network, first called the Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting System, changed its name to the Columbia Broadcasting System and became the second network. Mutual Broadcasting which was fated to have a short lifespan, joined the ranks in 1934, and in 1943, the American Broadcasting Company began. NBC, CBS, and ABC lasted as the three major American radio networks. Radio programming was unique in the 20s, and certainly a far cry from that of the 70s. Beethoven, soap operas, dance bands, singers, quiz shows, comedy, mystery, and commentators filled the airways. Since 1921, station WGN in Chicago has carried a show featuring the jokes and songs of two men, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. When they switched to WMAQ in Chicago, they changed their names to what is now merely history, Amos and Andy. You know, Andy, it's a great thing for us, this job with the construction company. Oh, yeah, and I like that Mr. Carter, the head of the company. He sure was nice to us when he gave us the tools this morning. Oh, yeah, he is a real gentleman. I tell you, I never... Uh, I'll get him. Hello, George Kingfish Stevens speaking. Hello, this is Mr. Carter of the Carter Construction Company. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter, how are you this evening? See here, what are you and Brown trying to pull? Why didn't you show up on that porch wrecking job this morning? Uh, well, you see, we, uh, we, uh, uh, excuse me, you say something about slowing up on that porch uh... I said, why didn't you and Brown show up on that porch wrecking job? Well, I, uh, 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 Miss Carter, uh, excuse me, uh, we got a bad disconnection here. Can't you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, I can hear what you were saying, but I know you ain't saying what I was hearing. <laughs> Another famous comedy team of this time was a couple known to their audience as Fibber McGee and Molly. What are you reading, dearie? Wimple's bird book. <laughs> he left it here last night. And you never read such a miss of mass information in your life. It's awful. Well, if it's that bad, why do you read it? It's so garbled, it, it fascinates me. <laughs> this book has got more wrong answers than a nervous housewife on Take It or Leave It. <laughs> Look at the title, even. American Birds and Their Habits. They can't even spell habits, you see? Where? There. Oh, that word isn't habits, dearie. It's habitats. Oh. Well, what I want to know is what their habits are. Who cares where they have their habits at? <laughs> Any bird lover who reads this would throw eggs at the publisher. <laughs> Say, when did you become such a bird lover, lover? <laughs> Ever since the first time I had quail with wild rice. <laughs> what particular statement in that book are you quarreling with? Well, listen to what it says about the feeding habitats of the pelican. All right. It says the pelican feeds occasionally on other things besides fish. By the mid-twenties and early thirties, other performers became legends in their time. Burns and Allen, Eddie Cantor, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, comedians Milton Berle, Bing Crosby, Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Red Skelton, and Ed Wynn. Names in music rang out. Fred Waring, 
Rudy Valley, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, Sammy Kay. News reporters and commentators made names for themselves. Who's never heard, even today, of Edward R. Murrow, Walter Winchell, Lowell Thomas, Floyd Gibbons, or Drew Pearson? Yes, radio as it began to grow up in the 1930s had many names of its own. Whether it was newscasters, actors and actresses, singers, or heroes, such as The Lone Ranger! with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. I am Silver. In 1934, radio saw two monumental developments. The Federal Radio Commission, which had regulated American radio since 1927, reorganized and became the Federal Communications Commission. This organization controlled not only radio, but telegraph, television, and telephone communications as well. In 1934, NBC began recording portions of its programs and commercial matter on discs. Soon, the other networks followed suit. Now, stations didn't have to worry about putting something on the air live. They could record it and play it back anytime. Another monumental achievement in the history of radio. Since news broadcasts had come into their own by the 1930s, reporting of recent news events was commonplace. However, one of the biggest on-the-spot news broadcasts was the tragedy of the Hindenburg, an 811-foot dirigible that exploded into flames in midair on May 6, 1937. A crew from Chicago's WLS was on hand to record the event in Lakehurst, New Jersey. And the morning after, the tragedy, millions of people saw and heard the event through the frantic voice of one Herb Morrison. They back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get this, Charlie. Get this, Charlie. It's fire and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast and all the folks between that this is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's the place is plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. It, it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flame is crashing to the ground. Not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the passengers screaming around it. I don't... I can't even talk to people. His friends are out there. It's a... It's, it's a oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. On his it's just like there are massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream, lady. I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly. For as tragic as the Hindenburg disaster was, it couldn't match the historical event that took place the following year. It was 8 p.m. Sunday, October 30th, 1938. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> 